Yes? All right. We're going to begin with newspapers. It's the Hal Boyle Award, sponsored by Norm Perlstein in honor of his friend Jerry Flint. It is for the best newspaper news service or online reporting from abroad, if we could all just keep it down for a moment. There are people who have worked hard on these submissions, and the winners deserve to be heard. Thank you. Again, the Hal Boyle Award for best newspaper news service or online reporting from abroad. The citation goes to Patrick McDonald, Christopher Gofford, Laura King, Kate Linthicum, and Henry Chu of the Los Angeles Times for fleeing Syria. The award goes to Martha Mendoza, Margie Robinson, Robin McDowell, and Esther Tucson of the Associated Press. Their series, well-deserved applause. Their series was called Seaford from Slaves. It was so powerful that it has won two OPC awards this evening. In addition to Hal Boyle, Hal Boyle rather, the team won the Malcolm Forbes Award sponsored by Forbes Magazine for Best International News Reporting in Newspapers, News Services, or Online. To say nothing, by the way, of a Pulitzer and a Polk, so there's that as well. The team of AP reporters expo- exposed an ugly truth behind much of the inexpensive seafood on our tables. It is produced by people held captive in Thailand's food industry. And as a result of this piece of overseas journalism, more than 2,000 people held in slavery have been freed. Accepting the award is Ramana McDowell and Mary Rajkumar. She is an OPC governor. She edited this year. First, we wanted to say a very big thank you to the Overseas Press Club. It's a wonderful organization, and we're honored and humbled to be here. We also wanted to say a very big thank you to the Associated Press for supporting us. We know this is difficult, expensive work, and it really means a lot to have the organization behind us. When we started this project, seafood and slavery were an open secret in Southeast Asia. People knew there was slavery in the seafood industry. It was called an old story. So two of our reporters, Robin McDowell and Margie Mason, wondered what would it take to make people care? And the answer soon became obvious. It would take linking it to their dinner tables, to what they were eating, so that people couldn't say, this is a horrible thing happening in some country far away, but so that they could see that it was really coming into their homes and into their lives. So that's what started the project. It took months of source work, months of asking around, months of digging, and it finally led the reporters to the island of Benjina. And Robin is gonna describe what that was like. All right, it took, even from Jakarta, 24 hours to get to Benjina, a tiny remote island between Papua New Guinea and um, Australia. So the first, two, first few days actually were a little bit frustrating because there's a village called Benjina and about 100 meters away, the factory grounds where we could see trawlers pulling up, we could see a factory, um, but we didn't really have access to the men. A few would come across, to the, across the channel now and then to buy cigarettes, visit the prostitutes um, to, get, you know, to get something to eat, but really, we had very little access to them, and on top of that, I do not speak Burmese. I speak some Indonesian, so people, I, I was able to find some people who could tell me a little bit because, as it turned out, some of them had been stuck there for five years, ten years, some even two decades. So um, there was a limited amount I could get. Um, after two days or three days, I called our Burmese colleague, Esther Tucson from Myanmar, and said, we need you here. <laughs> There is a story here. We've gotten some of it, but we have just scratched the surface. You need to see what's going on. She showed up. That was another 30 hours. Um, and she arrived, and the doors just swung open. People could not wait to talk to her. They chased her down the streets. They, you know, they wanted to be interviewed. They wanted their stories to be told. When we slept at night, they'd, they'd knock on our doors saying, Burma, Burma, you know, trying to, get, trying to, get it, to wake us up. Um, throwing rocks at our windows. We were staying in a little little um, villager's home. Um, they would call off the sides of the trawlers when we pulled up, set, trying to pass messages saying, our families, please tell our families they were alive. They would, one man brought, gave us the only picture he had of his mother. He hadn't seen her for 10 years, saying, please find her in the village. Please tell her that I'm okay. This is evidence that I'm okay. So at that point, it wasn't just about getting the making the link to the American dinner table. 
um, and getting the Americans outraged, we wanted to help find a way to make the story so powerful that these men would be rescued and eventually um, that is what's happened. We were able to follow the reefer ship after seeing them load the slave caught fish onto that boat to Thailand. It was a, um, we followed it by satellite. It took 15 days, we waited there and met those boats um, in trucks and followed them as they fanned out across the tiny port town. I shouldn't say tiny, it's a big port town um, of Samut Sakon in Thailand. Down small alleyways to cold storage facilities, tiny processing plants, m many places that did not have names. Um, and over the next few weeks, we were able to find out whom they were supplying to, which big exporting companies, including two of the world's biggest exporting companies. And our colleague Mar uh, Martha Mendoza used cu custom bills of records to link them to Walmart, Cisco, um, Red Lobster, pet food companies like Fancy Feast, um, pretty much everybody that, I would say 20, 20 big companies. Um, so. From there. <laughs> From there, we had two things that we had to face. One was we couldn't write about this while the men were still there, and that was paramount. We knew their lives were in danger. We knew that we could not show their faces. We could not name names. So in the end, the, in the International Organization for Migration got them out, just the few men that we were going to mention in our story. So that was... That was an interesting operation. They got the wrong men at first, then both the wrong men and the right men went, went out together, so, but that worked. And then the next thing we had to do once we had the company links was, of course, to confront the companies. So we were nervous, and our lawyers were very nervous. <laughs> I mean, Walmart, Cisco, these are not small names. And then, to our shock, what we found with company after company, nobody denied it. We thought they would categorically deny, no, this couldn't possibly happen. Nobody, not one of the companies denied it. And we realized that's because they know. They know that their supply chains are muddy and they know that this could be happening. So that was a real revelation for us. I don't think we expected that. So the work had in many ways more impact than we could have possibly hoped. It did free 2,000 men. Laws were passed, the company was shut down, but I think we still feel that there's a lot that we still need to do. And I think the, the clock has run out, but I'll just add that we were following one company and we were trying to prove that this one company was doing something wrong, but the bigger goal was to show how dirty the entire industry was and how many um, possibilities there are for abuse in the seafood industry in general, not just in Thailand, but, but pretty much all over the world. Um, so I think there's a lot of work still to be done on that. Thank you. Thank you.